It's too good. Zenith is a grossly underappreciated brand, but you're watching a video on a very obscure watch, so in this case I am preaching to the choir, we know this already. Build quality, legendary movements, if I could I would have an entire collection of them, and I'm sure many of us would. Their designs, not everyone's cup of tea, but if you're someone like me who was dropped on his head a few too many times in his childhood, then well, these sorts of designs, they appeal to us. Besides the El Primero name, the Defy is one of their most recognizable properties, but the origin story of this watch is beyond fascinating. I'm not just saying that. The first integrated bracelet sports watch before Genta had a crack at it. The first Swiss G-Shock before Japan stole the show. Arguably one of the strangest sports watch designs ever put to paper, but equally one of the most ambitious. Nineteen sixty nine, one of the best years in humanity's recorded history. Why? Too many reasons to list. Beyond Woodstock, moon landings, and the Beatles' last live performance, Zenith delivered on the automatic chronograph. And where we thought it was purely a landmark year for the El Primero, it was also the year that Zenith debuted another line, the Defy, the A3642. And when we put ourselves into that time, thinking beyond the 1960s and what the 70s would do to the Swiss watch industry, and what it would do to Zenith and so many great names, that time of uncertainty played into the design of this utterly bizarre machine. Now look, I know what you must be thinking. You'd be saying, this watch is hideous. I wouldn't look at it twice. Man, I, I can't blame you. It's not exactly the greatest, most iconic watch of all time. It's, it's not even the second greatest. Mo <laughs> you know? What's that old idiom? Don't judge a book by its cover. Well, we do that all the time anyway. This piece was created in defiance of the norms of the 1960s. The Defy was a watch that for all intents and purposes had an aim. And it was a very ambitious one, quite unlike what other watch brands were doing at the time. So let's just appreciate the advertising for this machine first. Look at these brochures. Boxing glove with the watch strapped over it. The unique Defy in bold print. And we will never get tired of these old ads. Say what you like, they just did it better back then. Now where the El Primero aimed at being one of the most complex chronographs of its age, which it succeeded in doing, the Defy looked in the opposite direction. It has its hard edges, brightly polished lines, facets that look like somebody had way too much fun finishing, the same gay frere ladder bracelet, a massive crown that looks really out of place. The first impressions will tell you that it's just a gaudy full metal watch with a date complication. And I kind of like all these metaphors. It was built to defy expectations, to go beyond what we see on the surface. Because its actual goal was to have these elegant lines, for sure. But it was also designed to be one of the most rugged, hardcore sports watches that Zenith had ever created. Believe it or not, it sounds ridiculous now when you say it out loud. That big crown supports 30 atmospheres, 300 meters of water resistance. The bezel and case back consisted of three parts so that they could all screw in together and lock the movement in place. That burly large case houses a huge rubber seal around its movement, making it virtually shockproof. And its clasp, it even had a, a flip out diver's extension. Why? Who knows? And in their prototype phases, like the now famous G-Shock story, these were thrown out of windows to test how they would survive on the concrete, and they did. The original Defy was given the nickname of Time Vault, or Bank Safe, because of this level of robustness. And I promise you, I'm not making this up. And when we really start digging into some of the more subliminal aesthetic qualities to this piece, like the applied plots on the dial, the early ones look like corrugated sheet metal. These gorgeous fume and sunbrush dials, the lightly brown tobacco, the aquamarine blue, the dark wine red, the inner chapter ring on these dials, how well measured, how well spaced these minute markers are. The oversized handset that actually looks brilliant, it's unique and distinct just like the case design. And should we even attempt to count the number of facets on this case? I mean, good luck in doing that. And let's not forget that this watch would become a dive watch, not a year later, with the reference A3648 and other incarnations. If you thought this design was obscure, then, well, it got even more extreme down the line. And through the 1970s, we saw how these case designs and bracelet integrations would change. I'm not going to go on a tangent and talk about El Primero's, but we can see how the Defy very much adopted the same sort of obscurity. Now, when we ask ourselves, what has the Zenith Defy become today? Ironically, it's, it's nothing like these original interpretations. It's very different. 
Under the ownership of Jean-Claude Beaver, we started seeing many Hublot characteristics extrapolated. Big, brash, often skeletonized in design, but also streamlined, like the earlier iterations of the 1970s. But the greatest irony of all is that in the court of public opinion, the, the Zenith Defy is seen as nothing more than a Genta homage. One that's riding on the coattails of the now widespread integrated bracelet design craze. But in reality, the original Defy was the one that got the ball rolling. It, it was way ahead of the curve. And that's the unfortunate story with the development of this piece because it has now become so aligned with everything else we've seen from brushed surfaces to hard edges to blue dials. It is really difficult to separate a watch like this from the herd and to identify what made it so significant. You ask anyone today what the name Zenith Defy means and I highly doubt many would give you a, a clear accounting of its origins. And in truth, I think that the Defy should implement some of these original features. I especially love that hard-edged, almost fingernail looking like facets on the top and the bottom lug. I believe some of these older dials should be implemented. It should be advertised less as a sleek fashion-oriented watch and something more along the lines of the original as indestructible. The original Zenith Defy is an industrial designer's dream because it's a watch that doesn't solve the world's problems. In fact, it leaves you with more questions than answers. But it shows ambition and it shows a style that is sadly lost, where it once defied conformity, its whole mission objective. Today it's a piece that looks like any other integrated sports watch. And that is why I think the Defy name is lost on so many people. And many don't know that beneath the hard-edged surface, it was something far more unique at its core. And to think that Zenith created revivals of all these pieces, like the original 1969, they made 250 examples. It must be very hard to get your hands on. This is the stuff I enjoy researching and discovering and sharing because it's not your typical sports watch by any means. It's actually quite a mess as a watch with no clear, coherent design direction. But as we know, once we hit the 1970s, things would change, and these watches were just as uncertain as the time period itself. But it was their goal and their intention to create this Moser Streamliner-esque design that presented beautifully and wore well, but deep down it was actually an indestructible watch of the time, the Swiss G-Shock. So let's hear your opinion on the original Zenith Defy and what do you think of the collection in general? How much do you hate the Gay Frere ladder bracelet? As always, thank you to all of you for taking the time to watch this video. And I'll see you in the next one.